have one one thing I must show. Are you ready to see up close the coolest thing you will ever see in your life? The answer is no because nobody could be prepared for this. I was not prepared for this. This was a gift to kind of celebrate my graduation by some friends of mine who I am very very close to and have always been like cheering me on uh, just in general but also like in regards to my degree. They are also very much involved in the study of history and teaching me about history and kind of us teaching all of each other about history but in that vein, in that kind of queer historical, the, the queer historian pipeline began with this. Yes, it is the book of the fucking dead from the mud. Look, and it's even got, you see, and then, oh, I don't know if the camera is really doing it justice. It's wooden. It's like this beautiful kind of heavy wood. And then you can open it and put trinkets in it. I haven't put any trinkets in it yet at the moment. Um, Cause I'm also kind of storing it vertically so it could be in my backdrop. But yeah, just, I mean, who even thinks of this? Who like, okay, our friend's graduating. We want to support her. I know, let's fucking get hold of a replica of the Book of the Dead from, like, just the biggest brains in the world. And they're my friends, so thank you to them for this amazing thing, which, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just perfect, it's just perfect. When I showed it to my sister, because I got it just for Christmas, my sister was like, yeah, none of the presents I've got you for Christmas are even going to come close. Even my brother-in-law, who like doesn't, it's not, he doesn't like dislike them, I mean, it's just not really his thing, but he understands that we really like it. And when I showed him the photo, he was like, that's really fucking cool. Hi and welcome to my channel Explain. My name is EK and in this video I want to talk to you about Scotland. I've tried like, it's absolutely freezing here at the moment. This is the warmest room in the house because it's so small. Um, but I've tried to do like cold girl makeup. I don't think it has worked. I think I'm slightly too old for this now but I have already covered the history of England from around 1066 to around 1603 and I have prepared an outline of an outline uh, exploring the 17th century. However, after 1603, England's history entwines so much with Scotland. I mean, even before 1603, they were, they were entwined a bit simply due to the kind of geographical, if not emotional attachment. So before heading into the 17th century, I want to bring us all up to speed on Scotland. This video is going to cover from around the 11th century up to the very end of the 13th century. So from the demise of Macbeth, yes, that one, uh, all the way up to the death of Alexander III. And then the next video I'm going to discuss the, I mean, to be honest, after Alexander III dies, it's like, okay, we're going. Like it's a whole different gear so I've had to, that's gonna be, that's gonna be the next video. In terms of sources, I am drawing from the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which is a, like a website, a database containing articles written by academics about different figures who are like important in British history. I've also looked at several books, including Richard Oram's The Kings and Queens of Scotland, and also Michael Lynch's rather heftier tome, Scotland, A New History. This latter was particularly recommended when I studied Scotland history in my undergrad and I have also dipped into some of my undergrad textbooks and the articles that I used for that course. Quick anecdote about Michael Lynch, I had I think it was a pdf of a book of essays in honour of Michael Lynch and like at the frontispiece at the beginning had a black and white picture of Michael Lynch so I assumed he was dead and it wasn't until several years afterwards. I don't think it was that Michael Lynch then wrote something, I think it was another person who had had this book in, you know, essays in honour of blah blah blah, and I realised it doesn't mean that they're dead. Malcolm III was the son of Duncan I, who had ruled between 1034 and 1040 when he, Duncan, was murdered by none other than Macbeth. Yes, that one. Although there is probably very little actual historical material in Shakespeare's version, there are prophecies and witches and therefore it is more fun. Especially the version we watched in school, which was, it was set in a restaurant instead of like 11th century Scotland and instead of witches it was three bin men, like being ominous, and James McAvoy played Macbeth as a chef and Keely Halls played Lady Macbeth. I'm trying to remember if it did it in like the original language. I need to look them up. They're called like Shakespeare Retold. They did at least two 
and we watched that one and then we watched another one which was Midsummer Night's Dream set in like a Butlins holiday camp. I have no idea why they stopped making these, they were incredible. That Macbeth one was also an early awakening for me and honestly I would rather fancy James McAvoy's Macbeth than as Mr Tumnus. So because of Macbeth, you know, murdering his father, uh, Malcolm III spent Macbeth's 17 year reign in England in exile at the court of Edward the Confessor. In 1057, Malcolm, probably funded by Edward, invaded Scotland and killed Macbeth. Macbeth's stepson was then recognised by some as the next king, but he was slain by Malcolm less than a year later in March of 1058. Around 1060, Malcolm married a woman named Ingebjorg Finn's daughter, who may have been the widow of a man named Thorfinn the Mighty of Orkney. Ingebjorg and Malcolm had two or possibly three sons, but in 1070, Malcolm married again. Whether Ingebjorg had died or kind of been set aside uh, is not really clear, but as the validity of his second marriage was never kind of contested by anyone, we can assume that Malcolm really was free to remarry. Malcolm's second wife was Margaret of Wessex. Margaret was the great niece of Edward the Confessor and sister to Edgar Etheling, who was a would-be uh, claimant to the English throne. But then the Norman conquest happened, and so Edgar, his two sisters, and their mother Agatha all fled north, and Malcolm ended up marrying Margaret. It is sometimes said that Edgar only reluctantly approved of the Scottish marriage. However, I would wager that both Edgar and Margaret understood how valuable an ally Malcolm could be to Edgar's cause, although this cause never actually succeeded. In the long term, this kinship to Edward would centre Margaret as the dynastic figure of the Scottish royals, whose devotion to her would result in her canonisation in 1250. Part of the reason that she, and not Malcolm, kind of took the spotlight is thanks to the events that happened after Malcolm's death in 1093, in the same battle that claimed the life of his son and heir, Edward. Margaret, heartbroken and already in pretty fragile health due to her extreme asceticism, died shortly after receiving the news. Now, Malcolm and Margaret had no less than eight children, but Malcolm also had sons with Ingebjorg and he had a brother named Donald. I can't believe I forgot to put this in, but when I was trying to work out like, okay, that's his brother, like these are his sons, like trying to work out who was who, I typed into Google like Mike, uh, Michael, I typed in Malcolm the third, like family tree, and it came up with, uh, why do I keep calling him Michael? It came up with Malcolm Canmore, which was like his house. Um, it was like his family tree, and I was going through it, and they were like, there was a there was a Princess Elena and a Queen Catherine, uh, like in his background. And I was thinking, who the fuck? Like nobody was being called Catherine or Elena at this point in Scottish history. Turns out, Malcolm the third is a character in the children's cartoon show Gargoyles, I think it's called. Um, and that's why I was, I was accidentally on, like, the Gargoyles fandom Wikipedia page, so. In 1093, Donald seized the throne, but was briefly ousted by Ingebjorg's eldest son, Duncan. Duncan had actually been a hostage at the court of William the Conqueror since 1072, and William's son, William Rufus, or William II, supported Duncan's coup. Duncan seized the throne in May of 1094, but his, quote, brief and stormy reign ended mere months later with his death on the 12th of November 1094. Donald then returned to the throne and ruled until he was defeated in battle in 1097 at the hands of Margaret's brother Edgar Etheling with the support of William Rufus. Records of Donald's kind of eventual demise vary but he was probably killed on the order of some of Margaret's sons and it was these sons that subsequently took up the crown. Margaret's three eldest did not rule. Edward had obviously died alongside his father, Ethelred had joined the church, and Edmund had earned the enmity of his siblings for siding with their uncle Donald. Incidentally, when Donald was ousted from the throne that final time, Edmund was captured and eventually became a monk in Somerset. So the task of ruling first fell to Edgar. Eorred of Raveau, writing later, described the king as, quote, sweet and lovable, employing no tyranny, no harshness, no greed against his people, but ruling his subjects with the greatest charity and benevolence. And Michael Lynch offers the uh, backhanded compliment that, quote, his tenure reign appears to have been marked by masterly inactivity. I think masterly inactivity, like, I feel we should reclaim that and make a more, like, when you are just resting, 
and you're like conser conserving your energy and your strength masterly in activity yeah we're making that a thing Richard Oram describes Edgar as a quote product of the new English orientation of his family with little interest in the north or west of Scotland and several historians consider that the reason Donald was able to take the throne from kind of Margaret's sons was quote some kind of reaction against the English influence and culture of the court which had marked the years of Margaret's periods as queen. Also in his life Edgar supported the monks at Durham um, which was an important religious centre well to like a lot of people they housed the relics of St Cuthbert but there is also kind of a long-standing association with the House of Wessex and St Cuthbert and therefore Durham. Edgar never married and so on his death in 11 1907, his brother Alexander took over. Alexander I faced an ecclesiastical issue, an issue that would plague Scotland's kings until the 1190s. Incidentally, the question of Episcopalianism, which is essentially the having of bishops, uh, would dominate Scotland's kind of religious and political landscape for centuries. But at this point, it was accepted that bishops were kind of at the top of this like ecclesiastical feudal pyramid. Um, so you had various parishes that were presided over by a bishop and then various bishops that were presided over by an archbishop and then archbishops which were presided over by the Pope and presumably, I mean, I don't know whether it's right to say like and then God presided over the Pope. Yeah, no, I think it, yeah, it means that God presided over the Pope. It's hard because like I don't really understand the ins and outs of like apost apostolic succession um, which is basically the idea that like Jesus chose Peter and then Peter like passed the baton down and so it goes all the way up to Jesus. Anyway, this is very much not relevant. Scotland did not have an archbishop at this point and it kind of lacked therefore that intermediary between its bishops and the Pope and England was more than willing to fulfil that gap. England's genius idea was to place Scotland's bishops under its own archbishops. I think it had two at this point, York and Canterbury. And when Alexander I sought to name a new bishop of St Andrews, he chose his mother's confessor, um, a monk called Turgo. The archbishop Rick of York tried to claim authority and Turgo was indeed consecrated at York. After Turgo's death, Alexander chose as his replacement a monk named Edma, or Aidma, I'm not 100% sure, um, but thought it best to have him consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury. But this whole kind of controversy was not just about like the relations of these two kingdoms, but also the kind of ever shifting dynamics of lay versus ecclesiastical and church powers. Um, and as that kind of wore on, Aidma was never actually uh, fully made bishop. And in 1124, Robert of Schoon was elected to the see. C as in S-E-E, -E, not to the C. Alexander married Sibylla of Normandy, an illegitimate daughter of Henry I of England, described by one chronicler as, to quote Alexander's biographer, A.A.M. Duncan, quote, a lady lacking in modesty and refinement, which is pretty savage and also makes me think she must have been so fun at parties. Um, but Alexander had no children by Sibylla and so when he died in 1124, the youngest of Margaret's children, David, ascended to the throne. David's impact is rarely underestimated in Scottish historiography, like he was that girl. He spent his youth in England at the court of Henry I of England, who in 1100 had married David's older sister, uh, Edith Matilda. I have explained in other videos, she was baptised as Edith, she then became known as Matilda. Um, because I study Scotland and England, I just call her Edith Matilda. Uh, traditionally, David is portrayed as kind of importing wholesale Anglo-Norman culture and like political norms such as feudalism into Scotland. Uh, and his biographer GWS Barrow argues that because of his upbringing it was quote inevitable that he perceived lordship in feudal terms and he certainly had Anglo-Norman interests through his wife for example Maud the Countess of Huntingdon. Uh, he had significant land holdings in England and his time at the royal court in England would obviously influence uh, his own ideals of rule. But this narrative um, has come under scrutiny in recent years, particularly in terms of feudalism. There was this kind of idea that he 
both personally was like feudalism is great let's do this in Scotland but also that um like nobles and other kind of lords that he brought with him and kind of encouraged to settle in Scotland that they also imported uh, feudalism and just like completely transformed the country. Alice Taylor for example emphasizes continuity in David's reign um, and argues that these transformations were far more gradual. She says quote migration and settlement thus did not cause the redefinition of elite power directly in the short term but rather indirectly and in the long term which I will say like I do agree but I do feel like you are always going to be able to find change to suit your argument or continuity to suit your argument when as always I feel that the answer universally is it's more complicated than that. Nevertheless David did leave his mark, he was the first king of Scots to mint his own coinage. I don't know if you can hear that dog on here but I, like do you want to come and say stuff about David the first of Scotland? Um he just barked to be like yes. Okay, we'll have to have him on as a guest next week. He was the first King of Scots to mint his own coin and did much to centralise his authority. He issued royal charters for lots of different urban settlements, perhaps between 12 and 16. He revived the Bishopric of Glasgow and was president of the consecration of the new Glasgow Cathedral in 1136. The parish system emerged and kind of was expanded under his reign. And like his brothers, he expanded the monastery at Dunfermline, which had been set up by their mother Margaret, um, and would eventually become a mausoleum really for Scottish royals, with no less than 19 members of the royal family buried here between 1093 and 1420, including Margaret's husband, Malcolm III, who was actually reburied from Tynemouth, and also David's brothers were buried there. I think Robert the Bruce is also buried there, apart from his heart which is buried at Melrose and like is this apocryphal maybe I don't know but I, I want to believe it's true um Robert the Bruce was like take I don't know if he wanted his whole body taken because I mean how are you gonna get that in your cabin bag you know but he was like take me or some of me once I'm dead on crusade and his bestie uh James Douglas was like okay and I don't know I can't remember the exact reasons why they didn't go to like the holy land of Jerusalem but Spain was also doing crusading at the same time so James was like I'll go there and allegedly he threw uh he had like I think he had the heart like round his neck or something in some kind of reliquary and apparently he took the fucking heart and was like yeet and threw it at the opposing army and I think then died so who knows if that's true but you know what a dinner party story not for that not for James obviously because he died but for me this patronage of Dunfermline Abbey along with the Vita uh, that Edith Matilda commissioned glorifying their mother and her illustrious heritage a uh, heritage that would then be passed down to her descendants uh, this cemented their mother's kind of image as a dynastic figurehead for Scotland's royal family. David, as I said, had married Maud, the Countess of Huntington, who was a widowed heiress and the great niece of William the Conqueror. Uh, during the 1140s, David supported his niece, Empress Matilda, uh, in her attempts to secure the throne of England, which had been left to her by her father, Henry I of England, after the death of her older brother in 1120 in a, a shipwreck. Instantly, Empress Matilda's rival for the throne, uh, Stephen, was the son-in-law, so he had married the daughter of Mary, the Countess of Boulogne, who was Edith Matilda and David and Alexandra and Edgar's sister. So it's like, it, I mean, yeah, it is kind of incestuous going on, but it's all kind of through marriage. So like Alexander married, Alexander I married Sibylla of Normandy, who because of Alexander's sister's marriage to Henry I, Sibylla was his step-niece. And then David has married the great-niece of William the Conqueror, and Edith Matilda has married the son of William the Conqueror, etc. So it's all, I think it's mainly, I might need to get family tree out, but I think it's mainly like step and by marriage, but these European royals, man, you know how they be. David's own son, Henry, who is sometimes referred to as Henry of Huntingdon, uh, actually predeceased his father. So when David died in 1153, his 12 year old grandson took the throne as Malcolm IV. <coughs> Malcolm has the misfortune, like purely through happenstance, 
to have a reign sandwiched between like two such historical heavyweights uh, his grandfather David and his younger brother William. His grandfather David, even by conservative estimates, was an influential monarch and had a kind of legacy on Scottish uh, history. And his younger brother William, who enjoyed the longest reign as a Scottish king uh, until James VI, and James VI was low-key cheating because he ascended to the throne when he was like a year old and William didn't ascend to the throne until he was in his 20s. Uh, William is known as William the Lion while Malcolm gets the epithet Malcolm the Maiden. Uh, and in Richard Oram's book The Kings and Queens of Scotland David gets 10 pages, William gets 9 and Malcolm gets 2 uh, while Michael Lynch just lumps him in with his brother William. Uh, I should note though that while Virgo is a feminine word, meaning virgin, um, it probably more affects the fact that he was celibate and just didn't get married rather than any kind of effeminacy. So the TikTok teens don't get annoyed. I'm obviously not saying that being effeminate is a bad thing, but I'm pointing out that uh, this idea like, oh, Malcolm the Maiden, it wasn't necessarily meant as like a dig at him by his kind of contemporaries and those after him. Uh, there we go. He's an interesting one though, because I've always... He, he gets written off so much but Oram his discussion of him is really interesting like he's militaristic to the point of being reckless uh he seems to have been absolutely desperate for Henry II of England to knight him uh he even went so far as to travel to join Henry's army uh like on military campaign in France he was finally knighted in this campaign but on return six of his own nobles attempted a coup and besieged him at Perth uh, they were so infuriated by his apparent, quote, disregard of his kingly duties that in his eagerness uh, to please Henry II, he had, quote, compromised the independence of the kingdom. And they did have a point. He had previously ceded Cumberland, Westmoreland, 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 and Northumberland, although it was in return for this restoration of the honour of Huntingdon, which was the lands uh, that his grandmother Maud had brought to her marriage. The siege at Perth was eventually resolved, but these were not the only domestic conflicts uh, with which Malcolm had to contend. I've yet to speak much of the Scottish Highlands, and indeed in this period, this kind of idea of a Highland-Lowland divide had yet to emerge as Lynch states. Quote, the difference between Highlands and Lowlands was of degree rather than kind. Both were aristocratic societies organised for war, held together largely through the force of kin. Um, and in this period, in the reign of Malcolm, we see the arrival of one of these key political figures associated with the Highlands and Isles. In this period, Somerled. Somerled was a major magnate in southwest of Scotland, and a lot of the details of his life have become almost like mythic. Um, he may have been brother-in-law to Alexander I's illegitimate son, for example. Um, but regardless, in the beginning of Malcolm's reign, he began the first of several kind of rebellions against or conflicts with the crown, ending in his death during a failed naval invasion of the Clyde in 1164. He had multiple descendants, some of whom claimed the title Dominus Insularum, which means Lord of the Isles, and they would prove kind of a thorn in the side of the Scottish kings for centuries. I won't go into too many details uh, of those thorns because it does become quite repetitive. Uh, you basically, it's these consistent heartbeats of each monarch's reign where disobedience breaks out and the crown eventually kind of stamps it out. When Malcolm died in 1165, he of course had left no children, so his younger brother, William, took up the crown. Like his brother, William was very much interested in the kind of chivalric knightly culture that had taken hold in Western Europe. Uh, and Oram argues that he was perceived as a kind of Francophile rather than a quote Gaelic king. William befriended the son of Henry II of England, who was also called Henry, and from 1070 was known as the Young King. And when the Young King and his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, rebelled against Henry II, William joined them. This was likely motivated by a desire to retake Northumberland. Uh, William had been named Earl of Northumberland by his grandfather David, but then Malcolm IV had surrendered it in 1150. Uh, and William hoped that kind of a victorious young king would restore his Northumbrian inheritance. Prepared to hear a lot about Northumbria um, in the next several kings. 
The Young King's Rebellion failed, however, and in July of 1174, William was captured and taken to Falaise in Normandy. The subsequent Treaty of Falaise negotiating William's release is possibly as significant a document as the later, uh, better known and far more cheerful Declaration of Albright, uh, which justifies Scotland's independence. For context, Various Scottish nobles, including kings, held land in England, so the honour of Huntingdon, uh, which I've discussed already. In this feudal society, they had to recognise the King of England as their overlord specifically for those lands. So as the lord of that land, you were a vassal of the English king. So when, in accordance with the Treaty of Falaise, William was made to perform kind of an act of public homage in York to Henry II, uh, this was not necessarily something new. What was new, however, was that William had to explicitly swear Henry fealty, not simply for his land holdings in England, but for Scotland itself. And for Henry, this was not theoretical. He, quote, regularly reminded William of his status, especially by summoning him to court to explain his actions. And Henry even decided William's queen for him, having him marry a relatively unimportant noblewoman named Ermengarde de Beaumont, rather than Henry's granddaughter, who William had requested. In the Treaty of Falaise, William swore to, quote, enforce the subjection of the Scottish church to English jurisdiction which had previously been kind of the main argument the English kings had been using uh, to allow them to interfere in Scottish politics. But Falaise would allow them to make the argument that Scotland itself was the vassal of England. And believe me when I say they made that argument. Even after the treaty was declared void in 1189, even after Scotland declared and won, their independence in a thousand different ways under a dozen different kings, uh, this justification continued. It formed much of Henry VIII's attitude uh, to Scotland after the death of James IV in 1513. Throughout the reign of James V, who was Henry's uh, nephew, he also kind of made the argument of like, oh, he's my nephew and I'm kind of the only patriarchal like figure in his life now, so I get to tell him kind of what to do, usually via Henry's sister, his mother, Margaret Tudor. Um, and then also you had the War of the Rough Wooing, which was kind of based on this as well a bit. Um, well, it, yeah, it was based on this, but basically, James V had a son, Mary Queen of Scots, and then James V immediately died. And so Mary Queen of Scots was Queen of Scots. Henry tried to organise a marriage between Mary and his own son Edward, who, yes, they were cousins. Um, and then I think some of Scotland were like, oh yeah, maybe we'll do that, uh, sounds good. And then Scotland were like, no, we've changed our mind, we don't want um, them to get married. And Henry was like, fuck you. And then he invaded, quite brute, like it was a very, brutal i mean it's all wars are like violent aren't they it wasn't going to be like puppies and rainbows but it was a very aggressive he invaded essentially and it was called the war of the rough wooing because he was essentially trying to force uh this marriage or this betrothal i guess because mary was still so young to take place um and he very much was claiming england as the overlord of scotland so it you know it had it had legs this they were ready to bang that drum vlog that dead horse for centuries. Henry's daughters were seemingly far less interested in it and then of course uh, Scotland was the one that kind of absorbed England in the end in 1603. Um, but that one damn treaty remained you know a fundamental building block of Anglo-Scottish relations for centuries. Ironically, given the explicit mention of England's kind of ecclesiastical superiority over Scotland, um, William's reign actually saw kind of a workable solution to this issue of Episcopal authority. Instead of Scotland's bishops coming under the Archbishop of York or Canterbury, they simply would not have an archbishop and would answer exclusively and directly to Rome. This papal bull of 1192 was known as Cum University. Yep. Uh, in full, Cum University Christi uh, Ugo Subjecti, uh, which translated to with the whole world under the yoke of Christ, i.e. that everybody in the world is subject to Christ. Uh, and this solution did seem to work for the most part. What did not work at the beginning of the 13th century was William's continued and increasingly desperate campaigns to get Northumbria. 
1209, war almost broke out between William and King John, Henry II's uh, second son. Yeah, it goes Richard, I've seen Disney's Robin Hood. William was forced to agree to John's terms in this incident, which involved giving up the claim to Northumbria and also sending his two sisters as hostages uh, to John's court with the kind of promise slash hope uh, that they would marry uh, some of John's sons and so eventually one of them might become Queen of England. But on the other hand you had that if William then died without issue John's grandson could become the King of Scotland so as you know there were pros and cons. These marriages however did not materialise in William's lifetime. William's wife, Ermengarde de Beaumont, rose to prominence in the kind of latter years of her husband's reign. In February of 1212, she mediated between Scottish nobles and King John um, as Scotland kind of sought English help to put down an invasion of Ross. According to W.W. W. Scott, these discussions also promised William's only son, Alexander, in marriage to an English princess, which was a far more lucrative match than that that had been foisted upon William. In 1214, at the age of 72, after almost 49 years on the throne, William died. Um, I think the length of his reign means it's quite easy to support kind of any assessment of his kingship. Uh, so much happened, so there's bound to be like some good stuff, like organising uh, the kind of papal situation, and then the bad stuff with uh, the Treaty of Falaise and kind of losing out in negotiations with King John. Unlike his elder brother, Malcolm, William left a son, a young son, um, who was only 16 years, year, the worst country jumped out, my lord. Unlike his older brother Malcolm, William left a son, a young son, only 16 years of age, uh, but well groomed for rule, who was inaugurated uh, in December of 1214 as Alexander II. Despite his youth, Alexander had no formal regent, uh, which in the later medieval period would become the exception rather than the rule. Um, the early years of Alexander's reign were those of conflict. At the dawn of his reign, he put down a rebellion by Donald MacWilliam, who was a descendant of Duncan II, the son of Malcolm III, who had ruled so briefly all those years ago. However, most of his squabbles were as expected with England. At the beginning of Alexander's reign, King John was having difficulties with his barons and Alexander sought to exploit that. The Magna Carta actually included John's quote obligation to offer justice to Alexander concerning not only his elder sisters who remained unmarried but his liberties and rights. However John abandoned his promises not just to Alexander but to the barons as well uh, after which Alexander invaded Northumbria signing a treaty with these ever rebellious barons um, which promised the return of the lands in Northumbria. Oh lord again a fucking game. Nothing new, nothing changed, same old shit. Same old fucking shit. It is like, come on man, like take a hint. Just, what have they got in Northumbria that they wanted so bad? Amidst all this kind of military back and forth with John, Alexander nipped down to Dover in 1217 to meet and do homage to the French Dauphin, Louis. Louis had been invited by some of John's nobles to take the throne on the basis that his wife Blanche of Castile was the granddaughter of Henry II of England. There is a pattern in this era where it's like, oh well we don't really like this guy anymore, so there's l this family is huge, someone somewhere must have uh, some sort of lineage that we can just be like, oh you take it instead. This Salic law ruins this. Not having it makes things far more exciting. According to Alexander's biography, Keith Stringer, this was motivated by, you guessed it, hopes that a victorious Louis might be well disposed to return the lands of Northumbria. Alexander was never successful in any of these attempts uh, and in 1237 he finally agreed to quote renouncing his claims on the counties in return for 200 pounds worth of land in Cumberland and Northumberland with privileged privileged jurisdiction over them. So he got some stuff just he wanted he wanted more. These kings oh, so greedy. We get another key ecclesiastical drama in Alexander II's reign uh, relating to coronation ceremonies. At this point in France and England, uh, kings would be anointed with holy oil 
uh, to indicate kind of the divine sanction that kings enjoyed. In Scotland, the coronation ceremony at Schoon, uh, which is near Perth, uh, was more secular and Alexander put much effort into trying to kind of obtain this this right uh, for the Scottish coronation ceremonies. The papacy however was under pressure from England and thus disinclined to permit it and this consecration with holy oil would not be granted until 1329. In the 1220s Alexander and his sisters finally married. Margaret married the Earl of Kent in 1221 who was actually a major power broker in the minority government of the new child king Henry the third uh, who had acceded to the throne in 1216 and Isabella married the Earl of Norfolk in 1225. In 1221 Alexander aged 23 married 10 year old Joan the daughter of his late and erstwhile enemy King John and thus the sister of Henry III. Joan was an active consort she attended negotiations between her husband and brother in 1236 and 1237 at Newcastle and York respectively however her biographer claims that quote her political influence was negligible as towards the end of her life she may have been somewhat estranged from the king. Uh, Joan died childless in 1238 and Alexander remarried in May of 1239 to a French noblewoman named Marie de Soucy. This indicated a kind of more Francophile direction for Scotland which infuriated Henry III although it never came to actual blows as Henry was busy beefing with Wales. Marie's biographer claims that quote, little is known about Marie's influence on the culture of the Scottish court, though the presence of some Frenchmen uh, within the Scottish court might have come about as a result of her queenship. In 1241, Marie gave birth to a son named Alexander, thus securing the future of the Scottish royal line. Uh, and Stringer argues that Alexander II quote, secured more recognition of Scotland's separate identity as an autonomous realm than his father had ever achieved. And it was this fiercely independent kingdom that the seven-year-old Alexander inherited in 1249, uh, being crowned Alexander III at Schoon. Much has been made of the events after Alexander III's death. I'm going to make much of them in the next video um, but I think we need to take a look at his pre-mortem highlights as well. As Alexander was so young he required some form of regency to rule on his behalf until he came of age. Alexander had no legitimate siblings but an older half-sister on his father's side named Margaret uh, had married a magnate by the name of Alan Derwood and Derwood was able to seize a leading role in Alexander's Regency government and Scotland enjoyed several years of factional bickering and an interminable revolving door of leading nobles. At one point the faction opposed to Derwood's influence appealed to Henry III of England for assistance. Derwood kind of cut them off uh, by trying to ally with Henry, arranging a marriage between the king and Henry's daughter Margaret. Uh, as a result Henry spent much of his kind of future son-in-law's minority uh, attempting to quote have Scotland administered in England's interest. Henry is not the only English king to have tried that, uh, he was neither the first nor the last. When in 1270 Alexander took up his personal rule he was on good terms with his father-in-law and he and his wife visited England and Margaret remained in England to give birth to her daughter also named Margaret. England was not the only kind of foreign political power uh, with which Alexander had to deal. In autumn of 1263 the king of Norway Hakon IV tried to invade Scotland from the southwest but his forces were rebuffed at the Battle of Largs after which Hakon retreated to Orkney which was at this point still part of Norway. But yeah, Hakon ended up on Orkney uh, after the Battle of Largs and then promptly died. In 1272 Henry III died and Alexander and Margaret actually went to England in 1274 for Edward I's coronation. One of the surprising things I have come across in researching for this video is how much these kings of Scotland travelled in the later medieval period it feels like monarchs in England and Scotland very rarely like left their kingdom uh, unless it was for war or like they were forced into exile like Edward IV um, or in the case of Henry VIII who in Scottish historiography still counts as medieval so don't at me uh, for like big international relations things like the field of the cloth of gold in 1520. I think James V went to France once, James VI went to Denmark once and then obviously came back to Scotland obviously and then moved to England and I'm pretty sure, I can't remember if it was every 10 years, but when he like in 1603 
after James VI went to England to become like King of England, uh, he said to Scotland he was like, I'll be back all the time, don't worry. And he came back like twice. So, rude. Mary Queen of Scots went to France once, obviously, then back to Scotland and then England, then she didn't leave England. Um, but in this period, they're just like whizzing about the place. It's like the reverse of Game of Thrones. So, you know, as time went on, the travel distances increased. It's very much doing Arya Stark goes from King's Landing uh, to Harrenhal uh, versus like Littlefinger going from the Vale to Winterfell and back. You know? Is that, does that count as a topical comparison anymore? I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, Alexander and Margaret had three children, a daughter who I already mentioned named Margaret, who had married the King of Norway, Eric II, and had had one daughter. Can you guess what she's called? Yes, it is Margaret. Alexander and Margaret had had two sons named David and Alexander, but both died without issue. When Queen Margaret died in 1275, Alexander remarried to Yolande de Dreux, a French noblewoman, but the pair had no children together. So when Alexander died in 1286, after falling off a horse in a storm, Eric and Margaret's daughter was Alexander's only heir. So what happens when a fiercely independent kingdom constantly fighting claims of English overlordship and seeking papal consecration for their kings ends up with an infant Norwegian princess as its monarch. A lot, actually. A lot happens. But you will have to wait, just like Robert the Bruce waited in that cave with that spider for my next video. So I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into Scottish history and I'm excited for you because you get to see me be excited about military history in the next one, which is, you know, words that I do not generally say, but the wars of independence are pretty fucking lit. So thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, comment, all that shit. Uh, and until next time.